first presentation looks at over-the-counter medicines in the US where there is an interesting system that mirrors very much what we've seen in the e-cigarette industry in terms of its development. So I'd like to introduce Jack Henningfield, who um, works at uh, a very prestigious associate, a very prestigious company called Pinney Associates. For those of you in the room who know Joe Gitchell, um, who was supposed to be here, Jack has um, very, very much uh, decided to step into his shoes and look, look at this issue. So Jack, if you would like to, to come to the front. Thank you. Okay. uncertainty about the products and mistrust among the public on some of the products for dandruff, for hair removal, for everything you can possibly think of, not just medicines. So the challenge that the Food and Drug Administration faced was how do we bring oversight without the potentially disruptive process of banning products and the costly burden on manufacturers of them being required to submit them for pre-market approval. So it was not so much different from what we have right now, but the numbers, the problem was much, much bigger, and it was addressed. This is what the Food and Drug Administration Commissioner said was the purpose, to build a permanent system offering all American consumers the best possible assurance for every over-the-counter drug that is not only safe and adequately labeled, but it will do what the manufacturer claims it will do. And it was an approach that really had a, what I would call a reasonable standard. What can we do now to reassure people? I like life, base, uh, life path analogy. So the OTC monograph process, it's for diverse uses. Just think about this. Antacids, antiflatulants, cough, dandruff, dental, oral care, like toothpaste, uh, mouthwash, eye redness, foot fungus, headache, minor pain, premature ejaculation, sleeping aids, all kinds of different categories of things with lots of different kinds of products, inhalers, creams, salves, different dosing challenges, and different ingredients. So they needed, they didn't have enough science on any one product or category to say, here's the solid science. They said, what can a group of experts do today in a room? So the way this works is that today, already marketed OTC and newly, or at that time, and, the, and newly marketed products would then be able to be on the market if they conformed to what the, the monograph said. If the standard, if they were within the standards of the monograph, they could just go on the market basically without an individual license. When is the process complete? And my colleague John Penny was in the room. He was part of this four decades ago. And the answer from the regulatory lawyer, never. It starts today on the basis of what we can do today. And it goes and evolves as the market goes and evolves. I, it's like Clive's glide path. I've got a new term for this. Thank you, Clive. Today, 
This covers more than 300,000 over-the-counter products in more than 80 different therapeutic classes, evolving more than 800 active ingredients. This is possible. I mean, what we're talking about in electronic nicotine delivery systems is very small compared to what has been done. There are a lot of precedents for this. New monographs are constantly in development. Existing monographs are constantly being revised and updated. It's a forever process because the technology changes, the claims change. It anticipates that. It's a flexible system. If a sponsor says, I've got something that's new and different, they can petition for a change in the monograph. Maybe they won't get it. Maybe it's too different. Maybe the FP will say, you know what, that is so different, you've got to go through another new drug approval. But at least there's a process. And basically, the process is similar in philosophy and approach to what we heard in the first two presentations today. Once a monograph is implemented, companies can make um, and market conforming products without FDA pre-approval. And if there are products that do not conform to the monograph, the company can go through the FDA and apply for a new drug application. Or a company with an ENDS product, maybe they want an ENDS product with a different ingredient that is way beyond what we think is trustworthy right now for a claim. They can take that version of the ENDS to the FDA and get approval for that. That's a much more expensive and time-consuming process. But they can do both. Because, uh, what are some of the characteristics? Because they're widely available, there has to be agreement that they can be used without a learned intermediary, in other words, a doctor. That they could be safely used without a prescription. And again, this covers things for dandruff, pain, headache, aspirin, It allows the labeling that people can use it. You have to demonstrate that people can use it. There has to be low abuse or addiction potential. That doesn't mean zero. And think about it. We have dextromethorphan, cough syrup, antihistamines, nicotine gum. They all have some addictive potential. They're not banned, but they're not like morphine. A group of people can agree on that. The benefits outweigh the risk, and the U.S. now has a public health standard that can be useful or hurtful. It's useful if the regulators say, you know what, the worst of these products is much better than a cigarette. That's the useful part. The scary part is when they say, oh my goodness, we don't know what's going to happen in 10 years, so we're not going to do anything. That's what we have to avoid. That hurts public health, in my opinion. So, the process includes safety and efficacy standards. Do they work? Are they reasonably safe? In information on ingredients and doses. If you take the eye drops, it tells you in the bottle what's in there, and then it tells you to put drops on and use as needed. I mean, there's so many products where we don't have an exact dose per use. Antacids, don't use more than three or four, um, you know, every half an hour. And people do what they will do as they need it. Packaging requirements are part of it. Yeah, that's basic and, and it's proportionate to what is needed. You don't need the same packaging on an eye drop as you do for, say, nicotine gum. Advertising and promotion is not regulated by the FDA but by the Federal Trade Commission. Now, how could it work for ENDS? Well, ENDS are diverse in form. They include nicotine. I think we can come up with some agreement with general categories. A monograph system would result in limitations. It would probably ban some ingredients and place limitations on others. How much formaldehyde is permissible to have a label that the product is safe and clean? Probably not zero. You know, this water has some heavy metals in it and other things. There's a standard. But I'm going to drink it because I think it's reasonably safe. The review process can help standardize labeling that is reflective of the actual content of the e-liquid and have standards, how many heavy metals and so forth. Required testing for chemicals um, that could come from the heating. In other words, if it's possible to produce more formaldehyde, then the product might be labeled can be with a formaldehyde, or the manufacturer can show that no such um, label is needed. 
uh, possible conditions in an Ellis monograph or guidance, uh, possible and plausible. And I think this is consistent with what we heard today. It's probably going to include some nicotine dosing potential in instructions for use, how to use the product to um, get what is intended. There's a lot of precedents that we already heard about today. This isn't rocket science. Different labeling might apply to different categories of products. Instead of saying, this is the only product we will approve, that system allows diverse products with diverse ingredients that conform to the general principles of the monograph. And the labeling can be appropriate for the different products. Upper limits for standards on nicotine and toxicants is almost certainly going to be there. Flavor regulation will be something there. Um, yeah, some flavors might be banned. I think there's some consensus among a lot of us about what kinds of flavors might be banned. At the same token, even with nicotine gum, we need different flavors to meet different needs of people. And then this is the, the general process, which actually is remarkably similar to what we heard this morning. What's exciting is that it can be done rather rapidly. What's scary is if it's interpreted in a way that takes years. And that's what we have to fight hard for. Public health depends on that. Thank you very much.